Ten years ago, people on the left informed the rest of us that cancel culture was a myth. Sure, the left deplatformed speakers and attempted to silence any dissenting opinions, but we were reliably told that this was not an example of cancel culture. It was simply accountability culture, that your ability to speak freely did not mean that you would not suffer consequences for your opinions. This was always a nonsense excuse used to justify censoring anyone who didn't conform to a leftist narrative, but there is a kernel of truth in there. It is true in America that freedom of speech does not mean that you can say what you want without repercussion. For example, if I were to go on some sort of racist tirade against Filipinos here on air, I can expect to become a social pariah tomorrow because Filipinos are the nicest people around and anyone who badmouths them would be thought of as crazy. But while accountability for speech has always been true, the left has attempted to use this principle to shrink the Overton window to reflect only their narrow worldview. Today, however, the left is finding out that accountability culture, like many of their blue-haired women, goes both ways. This week, Google fired a bunch of pro-terrorist protesters who thought it was a good idea to break the law and annoy their co-workers in a classic example of fuck around and find out. It's important to note when Google, one of the most evil companies in the world, thinks that you're too evil to employ, you're probably on the wrong side of history. I'm Tyler Cressman. Welcome to the Cressman Conversation. Okay, as we alluded to here in the intro, I'm going to be talking mostly about the Google protests that happened this week, but also a little bit about protesting in general and some thoughts on free speech. The background for the story in case people don't know. There was a fairly large protest at several of the Google offices this week where a bunch of pro-Hamas, pro-Palestinian protesters went in there and occupied some of the offices of the CEO and several of the workspaces at, I think it was different, three different branches of the Google offices. Now we're going to get into their reasons for doing this, but we're going to just talk about just Basic facts here first. So there were, in total, Google responded to this by having those people forcibly removed from the building. There were nine people in total who were arrested during this protest. I think I read somewhere that they said it was almost 100 or so people, 200 people maybe, who participated in this across the different protests. It wasn't just in one location. It sounded like it was in three different Google locations at the same time. Nine people were arrested, and ultimately Google has now fired 28 people who participated in the protest. Now, these protesters are protesting a $1.2 billion contract that Google has with the Israeli government and military. This is for cloud services as well as some AI, it sounds like, that they're currently working on. These protesters were protesting the fact that Google has any sort of business ties to Israel. We've seen this in on college campuses in the BDS movement. The BDS movement, make no mistake about it, is an anti-Semitic movement. The boycott, divest, and sanction movement. There's one Jewish nation on the planet, and the fact that people think that it's appropriate to target it the way that they do is ridiculous, and it's a reflection of anti-Semitism. That is just my opinion. The BDS movement is ridiculous. This is an outgrowth of that. And we've seen a lot of these protests that have popped up. Google, though, Google surprised me here. Google is a very woke company. They, the CEOs of Google, YouTube is probably the most pro-censorship social media platform out there. They have removed one of my videos and given me a strike for another one due to COVID information that I was giving out at the time. They're, they're a bad company. They're an, they're an evil company. I wish YouTube wasn't the default platform that people viewed video on. I think I wish we could all move over to Rumble and have Rumble just be the thing that works. I put videos up on Rumble. I encourage people to use Rumble. I try and use Rumble when I can. There are some features that Google has that I do enjoy, but for the most part, Rumble is just as good of a video player as Google. We should all be using it. That's a sidebar. Google's a bad company, but... They surprised me with the way they responded to these protests. They have fired 28 people, and they had nine people arrested who refused to leave the building. This is a change. This is a welcome change. We have seen the pro-Hamas, the pro-terrorist protesters out there in the streets protesting at companies, doing these sit-ins for corporations and at college universities. This is how we treat those people. 
This is how you treat them. This is how you deal with them. This it doesn't matter. Uh, ignore the the Palestinian Israeli aspect of this for a second, and imagine this: any company that deals with any of these woke protesters, any of them, for any reason, fire them, fire them immediately, or and have them forcibly removed from the building and arre- and and arrested for trespassing if they refuse to leave. This is the way. This is the way that we win because. I don't think any of these people expected to be fired. None of them expected to be arrested. They have they have no actual... They did not think they had any actual skin in the game. And to find out that they do will really make them question behaving like a bunch of morons in the future. This is, this is the path. Maybe if they look around and see some of their peers got fired or arrested, they'll shut the hell up and do their work. If you come to a job, if I employ you, if you're my employee, and you come to the job and you want to protest me, your employer, I will fire you. That is the way it works. That is the way it should work. And good for Google, a rare phrase that I'm going to say, good for Google for recognizing that more companies need to. You cannot be held hostage by your workforce for nonsense. Now, I'm not talking necessarily about union stuff, although sometimes I think union stuff is silly. I am talking more in regards to politics. If your employees are protesting the politics of your business, fire those people. Fire them immediately. It is ridiculous. You you do not get to protest. If you're saying, hey, we want a wage increase or, hey, we we want more vacation days, that's a different thing. That's a different thing. If you're you're coming and saying, oh, well, you're racist or you're anti-Semitic or you're, you're Islamophobic, if you're any of these things, if you're coming to the workplace and you're saying that, well, you can go away, go work somewhere else. I, we don't need you. We don't need you in the company. So good for Google for doing that. The the people, though, going back to the actual protest at hand, the people who organize this protest, it's a group called No Tech for Apartheid. These people are obviously idiots. They're obviously ignorant. They're obviously morons. No Tech for Apartheid, it's, it's a group that is targeting Israel, that's saying that tech basically needs to boycott and divest from the Israeli government, because they are committing apartheid. And the people who founded this, they're obviously anti-Semitic. There's just no way around it. It's not... The people who are out here in the streets, pro-Palestinian, so much of it is tinged. It's not pro-Palestinian. What it is is anti-Israeli. That's what it it comes down to. So much of it is that. You see so much propaganda, so much anti-Jewish propaganda. You see nothing that talks about... The Egyptians, for example. The Egyptian government shares a border with Gaza. On one side, you have Israel. On the other side, you have Egypt. Nobody talks about the fact that the walls are bigger on the Egyptian side of the border. The Egyptians do not let Palestinians into Egypt. They don't want them. So you're talking Arabs in Egypt. Muslim Arabs in Egypt don't want the Palestinians in their country because they recognize that they are rife with terrorism. That's what, they, that's what they know the facts to be. No one talks about that. No, we don't see anti-Egyptian protests in the streets because this is not a Palestinian issue. This is an issue that is anti-Israeli. That's what it is. It's anti-Semitic. It's anti-Jewish. It is just anti the existence of Israel as a state. It is not pro-Palestinian. Don't get it twisted. Don't get sucked up into it and think that you're out there marching for human rights. You're not. You're marching against human rights. You're, you're marching against the right of Jews to live. That's what you're doing. So no tech for apartheid. First of all, they don't understand the word apartheid. They don't know what it means. They don't understand South African apartheid and what that actually looked like. And they think that there's an apartheid going on in Israel because Gaza is home to the Palestinians and Israel has some occupation in the West Bank. Well, let me explain something to you. There's no apartheid. In Israel, the black people in South Africa, they were fighting for the right to vote, the right to be educated, the right to be admitted to a hospital for treatment. They had segregation in rooms. For example, if you were white, you would go in one entrance of the hospital, and if you were black, you would go around back to the little waiting room, and you would sit there, and you could not be treated by the same doctors. You were not treated in the same areas. You were not treated in the same ways. They were fighting for that. By contrast, 
Israel, one fifth of the Israeli population is Arab. They can they have the right to vote. They can hold elected positions. They can work freely. It's an idiotic point to say that it's an apartheid state. How? Because, oh, because there are people in Gaza who go to work in Israel and they have to go through security checkpoints because Israel controls one end of the country so that they check the, the food going in and out to make sure that there's not bombs, which they then use to fire into Israel. That makes it an apartheid state. Israel has nothing to do with the governments in, in Gaza, but yet it's Israel's fault that that place is a shithole. That doesn't seem to add up to me. How does that make any sense? It's Israel's fault that the, they elected a terrorist regime who's more interested in building tunnels and building rockets than in building infrastructure, schools. It is a beautiful stretch of land on one of the most gorgeous seas in the world. And it looks like downtown Detroit. It's terrible. I don't understand. You could have taken the more humanitarian aid has been poured into Gaza per capita than anywhere in the world. You could have made that place a nice place to live. They chose not to do it. So that's not that's Israel's fault. And because Gaza's a bad place to live, it's Israel's fault. Even though Israel has been out of that country for 18 years, they have no no. Israeli troops on the ground for 18 years until the 7th of October. 2005 to the 7th of October. No Israeli troops have a presence in Gaza. But it's Israel's fault. It's an apartheid state because of that. Gaza is its own country. That's like saying the United States is an apartheid state because Mexico is its own country. And we don't just allow what well, we do now. But we don't normally just allow Mexicans to freely run across the border and do whatever the hell they want. That doesn't make any sense. It's nonsense. These people are ignorant. No tech for apartheid are a bunch of ignorant fools. And we can't, we can't really blame them. So a good way to think about this, because it's a lot of young people, and young people just these days are less educated and know nothing compared to people who came even just a generation before them. Every generation, it seems like, we're just getting stupider. I don't know what to tell you. We're just we're doing worse and worse and worse with our education. So these people, they don't know anything. But it's not really their fault that they don't know anything. The reality of the situation is that we have set up a system designed for them to fail. They're not taught. They're not being taught in schools. Our schools are failing across the country. Our schools, our kids, literacy, their math skills, their science skills, their knowledge of history, all of these things are failing. We have basically, we've set up a world where the child's a goldfish and the goldfish is going to live like a goldfish and then we get mad at it without recognizing that it, it's gro it grows up in the water. That's, that's a fish. We're going to be upset that a goldfish is a goldfish. Well, the culture, society is the water. And you can't have bad water and then you have some sort of mutant goldfish or some sort of, <laughs> it's going to be mean. You can't have some sort of mutant goldfish and then expect or some sort of bad water that produces a mutant goldfish and then just be mad at the goldfish. This is a nature nurture kind of thing. We are nurturing children to be ignorant and be poor historians. We are inculcating them in a cult that knows nothing. So these, these guys, they don't know anything. They don't know history. They think that they view the world through that. We talk about a lot on the podcast. They view the world through that hierar hierarchical lens that says Israel has more than the Palestinians. Therefore, the Palestinians qualify as that oppressed class, and the oppressed class is always right. That's what they think. That's the only thing that they use to, to guide their ethos is oppressor, oppressed class. And this is not a good way to be, but it's not their fault. We've set the system up to fail them. So we can't be upset that they know nothing, but they do know nothing. And they, their anti-Semitism is on full display when they go out there and they wear the kifa and chant from the river to the sea. These people are bad. They're being bad, but it's not necessarily their fault from a moral standpoint. We have set them up to fail. We've seen these protests all over the place. This Google one is just the latest example, and I'm happy that Google is cracking down the way that they did and setting a standard that lets people know, do not mess around here. This is not a place for that. There's that scene. 
I just thought of it. There's a scene in Casino when Robert De Niro first takes over the casino and they catch those two cheaters and they take them in the back and they give them a little cheater's justice. And he says, you go out there, you tell your friends, this is not the place. You do not mess around in here. And they set them off in the world. That's what Google just did to these employees. They let them know. And we've seen this all over the place recently. We've seen it on college campuses where you have these people who, are, who will occupy the dean's office and demand whatever or, or do a hunger strike for six hours and claim that they're doing something. And I can't remember off the top of my head, I wish I had looked it up or thought of it earlier today, but there was a, a university that explained this great. They occupied the dean's office. There were several students in there, eight, nine, or ten. They came in there. Some of the staff came in there. They let them know, hey, here's the deal. You are being asked to leave. You guys are trespassing. The students said, no, we're not. We pay tuition, blah, 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 blah. Ultimately, a police officer came in, and he explained the situation to them. He said, okay. Just so you know, this is the last opportunity. You guys can leave. If you don't leave, we're going to arrest you, and you're, you're going to go to jail. And you will probably be suspended and or expelled from this university. There you go. And the students said, well, you can't do that. We pay tuition here. What do you mean? Blah, blah, blah. We're just protesting. We have a right to protest. People don't understand what protesting actually is and what it actually involves. They look at their, the people that they pretend to be heroes, guys that they don't agree with, my personal hero, one of them, Martin Luther King Jr., you say, that man right there, you know what? He knew what he was doing when he protested. When you protest, you are often breaking the law. And when you break the law, what happens? You get arrested, you go to jail, you make bail, and you come out. But the the idea is you don't just get to break the law and not expect consequences. And these students had no idea that there would be consequences for their actions. They said, oh, my God. What do you mean? We could be arrested? We could be suspended? Oh, my God. They all got up and left. So nobody got arrested in that case. In the Google one, we had nine people arrested, but they, they don't understand that. They're, now the no tech for apartheid, they put out a statement that said, oh, my God, Google fired these people. They had no justification. It is illegal. It is retaliatory. It is blah, blah, blah. No, it's not. They, Google has a right. You, Google, I imagine, you're an at-will employee. They can fire you if they want to. That is what it means. You do not have a right to a job in a company. I don't know where this idea comes from. We have things like whistleblower protection. If the, your company is doing something illegal or doing something and you uh, discriminatory and you take action against them, they can't retaliate. What is, how does this have anything to do with that? What does protesting a company have to do? It's not retaliatory. You, you are violating a company policy. You are actually breaking a law. You don't have a right to a job there. And we're, we need to see more of that. We saw the, the protests on college where people occupy the, the dean's office. Or recently, these big ones, that this one always gets me, shutting down traffic. We saw it in Chicago, I believe in Seattle as well, but the Chicago one I'm thinking of in particular. They shut down traffic in and out of O'Hare International Airport, one of the busiest airports in the country. They shut down traffic on the highway leading in. And you saw police officers sitting in their cars, letting this happen. It went on for hours. Arrest all of those people. It is a crime to block traffic. If, if you're there, by the way, if you don't remember what happens sometimes in these protests, people have been killed, not in the protest, but by the protesters in these kind of, act, in these kind of acts before. You're dragged out of their car and beaten. I drive your car. Drive your car through them slowly. You don't want to run people over, but give them the opportunity to move. Do not stop. I, why, I'm not going to be surrounded by a mob of people. I don't care what they say they're doing. I don't know what they're doing. If I'm in my car and a bunch of people start surrounding my car, I'm going through them because that is dangerous. It is dangerous for me. I don't know your intentions. I don't know you. And that is a terrifying situation to be in. We saw one in, I believe it was Austin a couple years ago. A guy was surrounded. There was actually a guy holding a gun outside the car. You could see it in pictures. And he wound up shooting one of them. I think he wound up going to jail, which is wild to me. But he was surrounded. They were beaten on his car, and he shot one of the guys who was actually holding a gun. It's ridiculous. You don't know any of the people out there. You don't know what their intentions are. You don't know what they're doing. These are not legal acts. And if you believe in what you're doing, 
If you're so pro-terrorist that you want to go stand in traffic and go to jail for it, have at it. But you have to understand, it is a crime. You should go to jail. You don't get to break the law. Even if the law is immoral, you have to understand, the law is not always morality. They are not synonymous. There are certain laws that we've had in the United States, and there are certain laws around the, the world that are not moral laws. We had a law that we had slavery. Slavery was legal. Did it, did it make it moral? No, it was immoral. It's the same with, with this. You can say, well, what I'm doing is moral. Okay, you're allowed to go to jail. There were abolitionists who went to jail for some of their acts during the 1800s. That's fine. You're allowed to believe. If you believe that you are so pro-terrorist that it's worth going to jail, then I encourage you to protest where your morality lies. But make no mistake, this, we can't tolerate people breaking the law in the country. If we want to change the law, we can change the law. But the law is the law. And the law should be followed. So, anyway, what we're talking about here, the important thing is we have to understand that the, the people who are out there right now, these people protesting Israel, which is what they're doing. I'm not going to say they're pro-Palestinian. I'll either say they're pro-terrorist or anti-Israel. That's what they are. They're not pro-Palestinian. They don't care about the Palestinian people, not really. The useful idiots in the media and useful idiots in the protests who actually do care about the Palestinians, they're just being played. That's not what these protests are about. The big question should be, besides the legality of these protests and how we should handle them, which I think I've covered, this has been a very interesting development in my line of thinking. I've been thinking a lot about the First Amendment. As everyone knows, it's the amendment so important, the founders put it first. The first thing in the Bill of Rights is the First Amendment de defends the right to free expression. It defends the right to peaceably protest and petition the government. It's freedom of religion and it's freedom of the press. I believe those five things are the five things in the First Amendment. The right to freedom of speech is an interesting one. You have a right guaranteed in the First Amendment. You're an American citizen. You have the right to free speech. That means that we, we there's not a lot of things that are illegal, but you have a very broad definition of what is legal. For example, the only two examples I can think of, I'm sure there are others, but the only two examples I can think of off the top of my head that violate the First Amendment free speech clause would be things like incitement to violence and child pornography. Those are the only two things. We've had other laws about salacious material, oh, li li libel and slander. Those would be the other ones. So libel, slander, Incitement to violent, things like child pornography. We've had other laws about pornography in the past, but those are the big ones, right? Like those are the ones that come right off the top of my head. You can have opinions that are terrible. I could sit up here and have racist opinions that are god-awful, and it would be illegal. It wouldn't be moral, but it would be legal because the First Amendment protects that. It protects the right. People think that there is laws against hate speech. They don't exist. There are no laws against hate hate speech. It is a fake category that people pretend exists under the law. It doesn't exist. There are, there are hate crimes. That's a different thing. But hate speech laws do not exist in the United States. They exist in Canada. They exist in Europe, but they do not exist in the United States. I can say terrible things. I can say mean things. I can say nasty things. I can say false things. I could sit up here and deny the Holocaust. I could sit up here and disparage black people. I can sit up here. I can do whatever I want, basically, except those things I just listed. Something that is a gray area, though, that I have been thinking about, and I've been thinking about it a lot due to these protesters, these pro-terrorist protesters. We saw in Michigan, there were people who were chanting death to America, marching in the streets, chanting death to America. Do those people have a right to freedom of speech? That is the question. Because freedom of speech is the defense of ideas and people and beliefs that you find detestable. So it's easy to defend free speech when it's stuff I agree with. That makes it easy. But it's hard when it's stuff I don't agree with. Because that's where freedom of speech actually matters. Is Does it defend speech that you don't agree with? Is there an exception to that, though? And I have come to the conclusion I think there should be. For example, can we... There are two questions here, actually. Can we use the protections 
of the amendments, the protections of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, the protections of the culture in America to undermine America. Should we allow that to happen? The system we've set up is this democratic republic with, that is focused on limiting government overreach and giving protection to personal liberties to the people. That is the, that is the function of the American government. Is it okay? For example, imagine you have some sort of Manchurian candidate type situation, but they're the Manchurian candidate being somebody who is actually a foreign controlled adversary raised in the United States to win high office to then undermine the system. Imagine we have that, but imagine we know or the person is open about it. Like, like if a rec- elected president, I'm going to take the Constitution out of the protected bulletproof glass and run it through a shredder. I'm going to use the military to shut down Congress. I'm going to do all these things. Should we allow that person to have power? If you are not an American citizen, should we allow, for example, take whoever, pick a high-ranking member of Hamas or the Taliban. Should we let that person into the country to try and organize and overthrow the government of the United States? My answer is a resounding no. I don't think that there is a protection that guarantees free speech to the right of people who want to then undermine free speech. You don't get to use free speech if you do not actually want free speech for everyone. If what you want is Sharia law, then you don't get to use free speech to advocate for the overthrow of the American government so you can then take the Bill of Rights that you use against itself. I don't think the system works that way. So, if you are a person in Dearborn, Michigan, who chants death to America, the step one for the U.S. government, is that person a citizen? If that person is a citizen of the United States, okay, free speech. It does protect you. I think it's, I think it's wrong and silly. If you're not a citizen, that's an immediate deportation. You don't get to advocate. I think that's a basic law. You don't get to advocate death to America and be here on a visa. Go, go back. You, you're not welcome. There's a, you're bad. Go, go home. We don't want you. We don't need you in America. If you advocate for the death of this democracy, you don't get to just be here willy-nilly. And that is the difference. If you are a non-citizen, you don't have protections of the Constitution. Every person born American is protected. If you are naturalized in the United States, the Constitution applies to you. You're a U.S. citizen. The Constitution applies to you. If, you're, if you were born in a different country, you come here, but you're a U.S. citizen. You have all the rights and privileges of a U.S. citizen. If, for example, you have been arrested, there are certain things that certainly apply to you. We allow illegal immigrants the right to counsel. We allow them to not self-incriminate. We allow them the protection of the Eighth Amendment against excessive fines and bail and cruel and unusual punishment. We allow all those protections. But do we allow people who are not American citizens to come to America with the expressed intent of overthrowing the system and imposing their system on us. Why are we letting them in the country? Why do they, we don't need them. America is doing just fine. We don't need more low IQ people in America. We don't need them. We send them home. I'd see no reason why it wouldn't meet the qualification for, to revoke a visa if you are in the streets chanting death to America. Now, they managed to hunt down every person who went into the Capitol on January 6th. Why don't we start reviewing tape of pro-terrorism marches in the United States and just start a mass deportation? Biden won't do it. And I wish, I would hope, that Donald Trump, if he was elected, would do something like this. There is no reason. We should not be approving visas for people who do not like America. That seems so Simple and plain. I made this point one time, probably probably seven or eight years ago. I was saying how I, me, personally, Tyler Cressman, I do not care about the race of a person who comes to America. It do, I do not care at all. It is a factor that does not, I don't care. I don't care about it in any aspect of life. I do not care about the race of the person involved. The only time that I care about this kind of stuff 
when we're talking about this is your ideology. That's what matters. So when we're bringing people in from other countries, we should ask them questions. And if they are ideologically opposed to America, like, for example, you ask people who are coming into the country, do they, would they or would they not like to live under Sharia law? If the answer is yes, we say no, no, you, nope, go back. You don't get to come. No visa. Because Sharia law is not compatible with Western values. It's not compatible with freedom of speech, freedom of religion. It's not compatible with these things. So you don't get to then come to the Western civilization, take advantage of our system, and then use those advantages that you've gained to then try and destroy the system. We are importing our own demise when we do that. And I like America. I love this country. I think it's great. It is the best example of what could be. But it, do, it doesn't last forever. No dynasty is indestructible. It, the Romans thought they'd last forever. Where are they now? That, Italy is a rather small country, and Rome is just a city with a big-ass building. So I, we have to be careful. America is not just going to stand forever if we continue to import problems. You cannot... External threats are easier than internal threats. Dealing with somebody attacking us, for example, would be easy for the United States. Dealing with somebody on the inside who slowly saws away at the support beams of our civilization, that's harder. That's a harder problem to fix. And we can see it. We see it right now. There is a battle. This is a thousand-year battle that we're looking into the future for. There is a battle, and it's going to take place. It's taking place right now. People don't want to acknowledge it. They don't want to realize it, but it is happening. There is a battle of incompatible ideologies. With, on the left hand, you have Western civilization, and on the right hand, you have the rise of Islam in the world. The, there are many, there are many, many, many great, wonderful Muslims in the world, in America, great, wonderful people who just want to live life and are trying to do it the best way they can. But the ideology... The Islamic doctrine, the Sharia law, this is, not, this is not something that both can live side by side in the same civilization. It can't be done. In Sharia law, the crime for apostasy is death. There are many places in the world that is taken very literally. If you reject Islam as a religion, they will cut your head off. That is a literal thing that happens today right now. So when you say in Great Britain or in America that you'd like to impose Sharia law. What I hear is, you'd like to kill me. That's what I hear. And that's what you all should hear. That's what everyone should hear. But we don't because many people in the West are ignorant because their neighbor down the street is Muslim and he's such a nice guy and his lawn is green and he works at the store or works at the, with you at the office and he's a great guy. I'm sure he is. I'm sure he is a great guy. But... The countries that I'm talking about, the people, they don't live down the street yet. Or maybe they do, and, but maybe they just don't tell you how they feel. Maybe they don't know. And we, there are, there's a group, it's a great example. There's a, the Muslim Student Alliance here in the United States, the MSA. I've known people, I've had friends who were part of that organization who left because they're, they're Muslim, but they are more westernized. And when we go to the Muslim Student Association... The men and women couldn't sit together. And the women couldn't speak without being asked to speak. And they said, well, isn't this sexist? And they said, this is how it should be. This is the way it is. That, is, that organization exists at SLU and Wash U here in St. Louis. And you say, oh, well, that's just the way it is. They, that's just the way it is. It's fine. The way the women are treated are not compatible. It is not the same with Western values as it is in Islamic societies. It's just not. There's not a country... That is a majority Muslim country that acts like the United States does in its treatment of women. That just doesn't exist. The education of women, the mistreatment, the abuse, the compulsory use of headwear, all of these things are all of these things are incompatible with Western civilization. And these to bring it back to the original point, these people at Google don't understand that, or maybe they do, and maybe they don't care. Maybe they're the same as the people in Dearborn, Michigan, who chant death to America. Just remember, it starts with the Jews. 
they don't like the Jews, but really they also don't like you. The people who hate the Jews also hate the Christians, but the Jews are the priority because of where they live. That's basically, that's basically the extent of it. Anyway, we're going to leave it there for the week. This is a hard topic. It's a hard topic because it's, it's freewheeling. It's, it has a bunch of different ways that it affects modern society, and it's a gigantic issue for the next thousand years. So anyway, we're going to leave it there for the week. I will catch you guys next Friday. As always, like, comment, share, all that stuff. I, I forgot to look before this episode on the comments for last week, but leave me something. I want to know how people feel about this, what the path forward is, the free speech arguments that I was making here, whether I'm wrong, whether I'm right, agree, disagree, any of that. Just leave me a comment. Let me know. And I will catch you guys next Friday.